This is David Dubal, and my guest today, the very famous writer, musicologist, Alan Walker. And why is Alan Walker here? Well, whenever we talk, it's about Franz Liszt, and there certainly is, Alan, something to talk about, because volume one of your projected three-volume Life of Liszt has been out for several months, and it is really making quite a sensation, as Liszt himself throughout his life made. First of all, how are you? Tell me about your reaction to the book, and um, let's just talk about Liszt for the next hour. Well, first of all, I'm very well and very happy to be here on this program with you, David. Uh, there's uh, 10 years of my life uh, gone into Volume 1. Uh, when I first started on this uh, project, I had no idea really what I was getting into. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you I don't mean, look like a fanatic, by the way, at all. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, I, I try not to be a fanatic, uh, most of all about Liszt. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Liszt, as you know, was a world traveler, and uh, there are Liszt archives and Liszt legacies all over the world. So uh, in dogging his footsteps, I, rather against my better judgment, have had to become a world traveler too. And uh, I seem to uh, divide a lot of my time now between uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, um, England, Paris, there's a large list I archive there, and most of all, of course, in Weimar. Mm -hmm. And I shall shortly, uh, in May, in fact, uh, be going back to Weimar for the sixth time uh, to do some more research uh, into Liszt's manuscripts and his correspondence. Alan Walker is my guest, and we're discussing uh, one of the great biographical projects of a musician in the last years, and that's his uh, volume one, which has just appeared, um, Alfred A. Knopf, publisher of France List, the virtuoso years, 1811-1847. And what you're hearing, of course, is a man dedicated. He has really had to follow in List's footsteps, which is not easy, is it? No. Uh, for uh, many years of his life, particularly in the early part of his life, when List concertized so much, uh, he visited practically every, every little town and hamlet in Europe. Uh, and uh, if one is to do justice to this man, it's uh, absolutely necessary at this stage in his let us call it his posthumous career, which has been so grievously misunderstood, it's necessary to uh, study the documents and to go to the places where List himself visited in order to find out uh, just what he did uh, and uh, where it all happened. Uh, when I first embarked on this project, I made a, a rule for myself, which has been actually very difficult indeed to, uh, to uh, maintain, and uh, that is never to write about anything uh, that uh, I have not seen for myself, any document or any manuscript. And this uh, has involved me in a great deal of time, and needless to say, a very great deal of expense. Well, uh, it's a flabbergasting book. I read it because I love List, so the moment it came out, I had it in my hands, and I just spent the next 48 hours. But it's just... It has to be reread and reread because it's it's so full of information. Never have we known more about this most enigmatic man. Well, I'm very glad that uh, you're uh, finding the book so useful. Um, I should say at the outset that I don't regard myself as a biographer, and uh, I'm really astonished uh, to uh, sort of turn around and observe myself here in 1984 uh, to think that I have completed one volume and uh, at the present rate of progress, it's going to take me another eight or ten years before uh, we finally see Volume 3 published. Um, I, rather like you, David, uh, felt uh, in my youth that uh, List had been uh, uh, gravely misunderstood by his early biographers and even by some of the performers. We can come on to that a little later. Um, and it seemed to me that what List needed in the second half of the 20th century uh, was a, an objective, complete biography uh, that would um, do his life justice in the same way that Newman's four-volume Life of Wagner or the, the uh, Spitter volumes on Bach. Mm -hmm. And um, the last thing that List needed, really, was a biography that consisted of two or three old ones joined together. Yes. And that had been his fate mm -hmm. uh, ever since the 1880s when the official biography of Lena Rahman was published. Uh, so uh, uh, my book is, uh, whatever else it does and whatever else it is, uh, it uh, is based on documents, and the reader can, can therefore make up his own mind about this. At the same time, since a biography is obviously not purely a work of science, but must, if it, it is successful at all, be a work of art, I've done my best to make it readable. Uh, the, uh, the scholarship is there for the scholars. Uh, the readability is there for, uh, for the great public uh, who simply want to know the main facts of List's life. Yes. 
the uh, the writer, uh, it seems to me, does have a duty, and that is to address his reader. Uh, and uh, I wanted a book that would reach out and uh, give the the facts of Liszt's life uh, to the public, and uh, and not uh, be a book that would be uh, uh, too dry and too esoteric. Well, no, you know, too dry is wrong because there's nothing dry about it. Mm-hmm. This is a uh, this is going to. Uh, certainly rank with uh, the Marchand biography in three volumes of Byron. Um, this is the highest scholarship by far we have ever even dreamed of with, with Liszt. And uh, I can only say that uh, I, I wish you well in these years to come because as I read this and I see the density, and I don't mean density to scare you off in the sense of uh, uh, Teutonic thoroughness merely by any means, but uh, you used your space very well, and space is hard to come by these days. It seemed to me after reading this, this um, taking list up to 1847, Alan Walker, that you needed really five volumes, not three. Did you ever think of that? Um, I didn't think of five, but I did think of four. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fourth volume may, may well become necessary, and I shall have a clear idea of, of that after the anniversary year mm-hmm. in 1986, uh, because more and more material is turning up. And I think the only way that I can accommodate it, since the basic ground plan of all three volumes is now set, uh, is to go on to a volume that would, uh, a fourth volume, uh, that would accommodate all these bits and pieces that are meanwhile being accumulated. Uh, but I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to hear you say that, uh, that the, the book is so useful and so important, because uh, it's difficult for me to have a detached view about it. I'm still far too close and far too involved. Yes. I write every day. I write always between the hours of 8 a.m. and 12 noon, and I'm right in the middle of volume two now, uh, which is two-thirds of the way finished. Um, and uh, without uh, some uh, respite, uh, it's difficult for me to be objective about my own work. I should say that the volume one that we're now looking at, um, I uh, discarded uh, two-thirds of the book. What you're actually looking at is a is the compressed one-third that was left, mm. uh, because uh, I am particular about the writing. I'm a, 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 a fiend for economy. I don't like to waste words. Mm-hmm. I like every sentence to tell. Uh, and I spend a great deal of time editing uh, prose that I may have written a week ago or even a year ago. I put it in in my desk and uh, try to uh, look at it again in a month or so to, to read it with an objective eye. And uh, if I think it's wrong, if, if it doesn't uh, uh, meet the standards I set myself, then I simply throw it out. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not an easy man on yourself, and uh, List certainly wasn't easy on himself. Mm. So uh, you two are um, in harness, as they say, forever now. And uh, I, for one, am very, very pleased to see the beautiful job that uh, Knopf has done. I hope you're pleased with it, because it, it certainly looks like a beautiful book. Yes, I'm absolutely delighted. I discovered um, Alfred, uh, the firm of Alfred Knopf rather late in the day. Uh, the book originally uh, started out as a Faber project in London. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the meantime, I have moved to North America, and it seemed to make more sense for me to find a... Uh, an American publisher, and uh, all uh, everyone was telling me to approach uh, Robert Gottlieb at Alfred Knopf, which I did, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm very happy about that. The firm of Knopf is rather like a delightful family, and uh, once they uh, take a project to their heart, uh, really they'll do the finest possible job for you. And the making of the book, its design, its uh, uh, all the features about it, I'm, uh, I couldn't be more pleased. Oh, that's wonderful, Alan Walker. Uh, Alan Walker is my guest, and we're discussing volume one of his uh, Great List project, uh, The Virtuoso Years, 1811 to 1847. And we're going to stop our conversation for uh, around three minutes because we're going to hear the Transcendental Etudes number one and two played by Lazar Berman. Liszt's pieces, uh, of course, stunned the piano world, and they're still stunning. And we hear in this prelude, Alan, I I, I think you could say a spiritualized Cromer study, instantly, you know, Listian. And then we have a uh, a wonderful Paganini um, portrait, a rather diabolical piece that he... um, just marks molto vivace. So let's hear two transcendental etudes, one and two, in the hands of the Russian artist Lazar Berman. <laughs>
You have just heard the Transcendental Etudes 1 and 2, Lazar Berman, the pianist, and my guest today, Alan Walker. Alan, if you can wait one minute, I will be back after this message, and we will continue discussing Franz Liszt. This is David Duval, and my guest is Alan Walker, the biographer of Liszt, and I have known him for many years. The first encounter I had with Alan Walker's work is a, is a slim volume, which is just packed with aesthetics, and it's called, I believe, An Anatomy of uh, Music Criticism. That is correct, yes. Yes, that's a wonderful book, and I've had many uh, fine hours with it. Then later on, you did a symposium of Chopin. Uh, you edited... Uh, uh, a wonderful um, uh, a group of p uh, people doing uh, different essays on Chopin, and then you did Liszt, and then Liszt, of course, has become your nemesis in a way because you you are with him every day. Uh, that is correct. You ever hate I, him? Um, occasionally, mm -hmm. I'm infuriated because well, he travels so much, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, there's so much material. Uh, he is, uh, you know, if someone were to attempt to write a biography along similar lines of um, Shakespeare, let us say, uh, the problems would be a very, a very different kind because yes. there's there's <laughs> little, if any, documentation there. Yes. Uh, so the biographer has to invent a great deal of it. Mm -hmm. But with Liszt, there's so much. The problem is uh, what to exclude and, indeed, how to interpret the information that's there. Is it true you've already had 100 reviews of this book? Uh, yes, more than a hundred in uh, in three languages, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's won the uh, the Book of the Year uh, award by the Sunday Times in uh, in uh, England, and uh, it was selected as one of the music books of the year by the Sunday Observer. It's just received the uh, James Tate Black Memorial Awa Award issued by the University of Edinburgh, and so uh, in the brief. Uh, months that the book has been in circulation, um, I couldn't be more pleased with the with the reception it's had. I'm sure Knopf is also pleased, and um, we uh, well let 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 me ask you this about Franz Liszt: Was there ever a greater energy machine in the 19th century? A man with a greater constitution or more um, uh, complex in nature? Uh, well, if such a man ever did exist, I haven't heard about him. Nor I. Uh, the uh, list uh, output uh, is, of course, incredible. There are more than 1,300 individual pieces of music, and many of them exist in uh, several different versions. At the same time, there are more than 10,000 letters that Liszt wrote to more than 800 correspondents across the world. <laughs> uh, he kept sketchbooks for his letters uh, because he drafted them on his long journeys across Europe. And at the same time, as you know, he was active as a teacher and as a conductor. Um, and uh, he, he uh, lent his name to uh, any and every cause. He was one of the great philanthropists of music, uh, an incredibly complex but at the same time an incredibly uh, warm and lovable human being. Well, obviously also one of the most uh, magnetic of human beings because uh, uh, statements coming from people like uh, Rosenthal, the most wonderful man I had ever met, things like this abound in the list literature, some of it, of course. The list literature, of course, has so much legend to it. This is something you've had to sift through constantly. Yes, it isn't that legends are necessarily false, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes they can be highly misleading and very often they contradict uh, themselves. So the biographer has to tread very warily. Uh, eyewitness reports are not necessarily the best evidence on which to base a biographical narrative. Uh, but uh, your main point seems to be correct enough. Uh, whether you deal with the late list, uh, the benevolent list, uh, or the uh, early list, the barnstorming virtuoso, it does seem to be the case that uh, when anyone who, uh, who ke came within his orbit, uh, they immediately fell under his spell. There are great travelers like uh, Hans Christian Andersen uh, and George Eliot, the English novelist who visited Liszt in, in Weimar. Uh, they are just two of many people who kept diaries, and they w were both bowled over by their first impressions of this, uh, this wonderful man. Yes, and these were rather conservative people like uh, Grieg also. These, these impressions were, uh, were unbelievable. Yes. I mean, he, he had something that was, um, well, perhaps once a century. Yes. Uh, uh, he's in a way also the inventor of the public pianist, isn't he? Yes. Uh, what we now conventionally call the piano recital uh, was really created by Liszt. And uh, it might be very <clears throat> helpful to just review uh, exactly what Liszt, uh, what, 
what he did during the uh, 1840s uh, in his heyday as a touring pianist. Mm -hmm. He was really the first uh, pianist to give concerts alone. Yeah. Uh, he once uh, said in a letter about that time, around 1839, le concert c'est moi. Yes. The concert is, is me. Uh, and uh, he attached the name recital uh, to his concert. He was really the first artist to use that term. Uh, he was the first pianist to uh, play uh, all of his recitals from memory and to include in the recitals the whole of the keyboard repertory as it then existed uh, from Bach to Chopin. Um, he uh, was the first to place the piano in its uh, modern position uh, with the keyboard at right angles to the stage and the open lid reflecting the sound across the auditorium. I thought uh, that was other... Dussex. Uh... Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a piece of esoteric knowledge that I would uh, uh, have expected you to know. Uh, but uh, he abandoned the practice. He tried it out once in a while. Yes. Uh, but uh, we have to uh, make a distinction uh, here between uh, Ducek and uh, Liszt. Uh, Liszt really uh, was the first pianist to understand that the concert hall in which you play is itself a musical instrument, and you can make that instrument sound uh, by uh, virtue of the position that you place your piano in. And he experimented. Uh, he, he didn't uh, suddenly have a revelation and think, now this is it. Uh, but he came to the view quite independently of Ducek that the uh, what we call the modern position for the piano uh, was the right one for it. Um, he was also the, the first uh, pianist, of course, to tour Europe uh, at a time when uh, travel was extremely uncomfortable. This was before, really, the invention of the railway engine, or at any rate, until the, before uh, the European cities had been connected by railways. And so he had to travel everywhere by, uh, uh, by coach and horses. And uh, he had many adventures along the way. Uh, a couple of times he uh, he sprained or, or broke limbs he, as, as the carriage was mm -hmm. uh, uh, went over a pothole and uh, he himself was uh, was uh, pitched onto the road. That happened in England, of all places, in, in 1840. Um, at the same time, he um, uh, would compose while he was on tour. And uh, about his only rest was the rest that he had... Uh, uh, between uh, towns and villages, he would sometimes give three or four concerts a week. And in the space of the seven years, uh, the so-called years of transcendental execution, uh, he's known to have given well over a thousand concerts. Mm. And then at the age of 35, he retired, um, having accomplished everything that it was possible for, for him to do. Uh, and he then turned his attentions to, uh, to other things. One would wish that... Uh, other pianists who will remain unnamed would also think of retiring at the age of 35. Yes, I understand <laughs> that. Alan Walker is my guest today, and we're going to um, continue with music now. List is our subject today. And uh, how about a word about the transcendental etude number five called Fufile? That's a, a real treacherous piece of technique. It's probably not only uh, one of the most difficult pieces that uh, Liszt wrote for the piano, uh, but uh, one of the most difficult pieces ever written for the instrument. Mm. Uh, it calls for uh, an abnormally uh, flexible fourth finger, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to play this uh, devilishly difficult study up to speed, uh, well, only the heroes of the keyboard really can do it justice. I have a suspicion that it was probably a little easier to play in Liszt's time than it was than it is today, yes. simply because the modern piano is a is a rather different and heavier instrument uh, than the the Erard of the 1840s right. for which Liszt first wrote this. Alan, let's see if uh, Lazar Berman can do it. Good. Okay, the fifth transcendental etude of Liszt, Lazar Berman. <laughs> Thank you. 
Faux Filet or Will of the Wisp, I guess, and it's the fifth concert uh, Transcendental Etude de France list, and uh, Lazar Berman, the pianist, and my guest today is Alan Walker, the list biographer, and we'll be right back with more discussion after this message. Alan Walker is here with me, and we're discussing his uh, Volume 1, The Virtuoso Years, which takes Liszt's life up to 1847 when he retired from the concert stage. Now, Alan, that's, that was a, certainly an exciting moment in the history of um, Liszt's life and Europe. Is, it, is the life now more interesting or less so, do you think, coming up in Volume 2 and 3? Um, for me, it's more interesting uh, volume 2 will cover a shorter period. Uh, the The time span is 1848 to 61, which coincides with his Weimar years, mm -hmm. and that is, in fact, the title of Volume 2, The Weimar Years. And the reason it's more exciting for me is that uh, relatively uh, little was known about that period, um, and uh, I'm in the privileged position of uh, discovering a great deal of, of new and unsuspected material. Uh, List, uh, let me put it this way, in the first part of his life, uh, List went out and met the world. Mm -hmm. In the period of the life that I'm now dealing with, the world comes and visits List. He's there uh, ensconced in Weimar, and uh, anybody who's anybody who visits Weimar must visit List in the Altenburg, the large house on the hill, uh, where he lived for 13 years with Princess Caroline von Sein Wittgenstein. That's a biography uh, in itself, isn't oh, it? Oh, yes, it is. She was a remarkable lady, and the List biographies have not really done her justice. Uh, I find myself uh, very sympathetically inclined towards her, and I must be careful as I tell her story uh, not to let my sympathies show, mm -hmm. uh, because, again, I wish to be objective. This is the only way to proceed. Uh, but thanks to Caroline, uh, List, for the first time in his life, uh, had the sort of uh, secure domestic environment uh, which enabled him to concentrate on composition. Not that he hadn't composed a great deal of music before going to Weimar, uh, but uh, he was able to uh, uh, to concentrate on the larger forms and particularly to turn his attention to orchestral program music. Twelve of the symphonic poems were written there. The great B minor sonata, the Dante and the Faust symphonies, uh, all these works date from the Weimar years. Amazing period. And uh, Caroline was uh, his uh, companion and uh, helpmate uh, during this uh, very important period of his life. And an anchor, too. Indeed. Uh, one of the things he could that, get very uh, restless. Oh yes, this is, there's no uh, question about that. He had a, uh, a demon inside him. He was a, uh, a very volatile personality. But one of the things that is slowly coming to light in the course of my researches uh, is the fact that Liszt enjoyed a, uh, a very uh, uh, rich and varied career as a conductor. Uh, not much is known about him as a conductor if you read the conventional biographies, uh, but uh, if one does uh, basic research in the uh, archives in Weimar, in the old theater there, uh, you find the old handbills which uh, tell an, uh, an unknown story mm -hmm. uh, that from almost the moment he arrived in Weimar, uh, Liszt conducted uh, one, two, sometimes three concerts a week in the Weimar Theatre. Uh, and moreover, he travelled. He uh, was the music director of the great uh, German festivals in such places as Dusseldorf and Karlsruhe and Ballenstedt. Uh, and uh, between uh, the years 48 to uh, 1861, he gave the first performances of 40 operas can you imagine oh, such a feat? Is, the more I read, the more I hear about him, it, it, it is staggering. It's just One staggering. wonders when he had time, really, to, to do everything. Yeah. Uh, we know that he, uh, he, he uh, adopted for himself uh, crushing uh, work uh, standards. Uh, he got up at uh, 4.30 every morning, for instance, and he would compose until about uh, uh, 9, uh, 10 a.m., and then the princess would join him for late breakfast in his rooms in the Altenburg, then he would dash off to, uh, to a rehearsal down to the theater a couple of miles away, and then he might give a master class as some of his uh, young eagles descended on him at the Altenburg. Um, the, the first generation of pianists that worked with him, I personally think, are far more significant in the history of piano playing than the, the later people who were with him in the uh, 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of, uh, of young men of the caliber of Hans von Bülow uh, and Tausig sure. and Klinvort. Uh, these were giants, and they, they helped to... Uh, to turn the uh, the uh, the piano uh, and its repertory in a completely new direction. Yes. Alan, let's stop and listen to another of the transcendental etudes. Uh, this one, Wild Hunt, number eight in C minor, and uh, you used the word volatile before. This certainly is some reckless uh, 
uh, an etude, isn't it? It's just unbelievable. Uh, yes, again, this is a uh, one of the uh, the peaks of uh, 19th century keyboard literature, and uh, only the giants can tackle it today. Yes, none but the heroes mm-hmm. of the keyboard. Let's hear uh, Lazar Berman play The uh, Wild Hunt. <laughs>
You have just heard uh, Lazar Berman, Russian pianist who hasn't been here for a while. I wonder why. Um, and he played the uh, eighth transcendental etude of Liszt, and uh, Liszt's life is transcendental, to say the least. And I have the transcendental biographer of Liszt here, Alan Walker, and we're going to, uh, after this message, speak uh, a little bit more about Liszt and then some more music. I am back. My guest today, Alan Walker, musicologist, musician, a uh, very objective biographer of Liszt. I'll ask you this question. Did you, by any chance, ever feel that at the end of the third volume you might just end up hating the poor man? No. My problem, in fact, David, has been the opposite. Right. Uh, how to avoid uh, my uh, admiration and uh, love of, uh, of Liszt uh, uh, getting in the way of my work. Now, when you say getting in the way, uh, are are you frightened that someone is going to say, "Oh, he's he's too much an idolator and he's not being objective enough," because some some feeling of love and admiration has got to creep in? I have felt uh, uh, now, uh, definitely an objective biography here, Alan, but uh, written by a man who very much treasures Liszt. Yes, I believe it's the job of a biographer to play counsel for the defense, certainly not counsel for the prosecution. Uh, this has been the undoing of a number of biographers in the past. I see no point in writing a book about anything or about anybody simply to attack it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my problem, however, uh, with uh, this biographical narrative is uh, while uh, I don't object to, to my role as counsel for the defense coming through, I have to be careful uh, that I don't give less the benefit of the doubt when uh, the, the point of interpretation is at stake. Uh, otherwise, uh, critics uh, who uh, read the book uh, are simply going to say that I'm too involved uh, with the subject. Mind you, um, as I said a little earlier, I've given up 10 years of my life simply to produce volume one, and it will take another 10 years for the remaining two volumes to appear. So perhaps I can be forgiven if from time to time I'm less than, uh, uh, than uh, the, uh, uh, how shall I say, uh, if I fall short of my objective standards. Ah, mm. you will be forgiven in my eyes, that's for sure. Um, now, why will volume two take volume two and three take only ten years? While volume one is taking, have you learned through the process of? Uh, well, I uh, am advancing along a broad front, if I can put it like that, and therefore a lot of the basic research for volumes two and three um, was done uh, while I was researching volume one. You know, when someone begins a goal, they never really have any idea of where it will take one. And in my case, I must tell you that. Uh, I'm always amazed at how upset I get because the goal at first is so wonderful, but then I say, well, I can't get anything else in. Mm -hmm. now, are, are, do you ever have any bitterness that this, this man's life now has, uh, has enrolled all of your, your, your time? Um, no, uh, simply because uh, before I embarked on the project, I had already published uh, six other books which cover a fairly wide range of activity, um, and uh, I hope that there will be years enough left when Volume 3 has been published for me to go back to what was my early interest, uh, namely musical analysis and musical aesthetics, yes. uh, in which fields my ideas are continuing to develop. Mm -hmm. I should say that uh, the biography, while it sounds as if it's a full-time project, and I sometimes think that it is, is really something I do in my spare time. Your uh, spare I'm, time? Well, I'm a full-time <laughs> academic, after all, uh -huh. and I carry a full teaching load at my university in Canada, uh, where I teach mainly uh, uh, musical analysis and, and, tell uh, us where that is. and the criticism of music. Uh, that's at McMaster University in the city of Hamilton, about uh, 30 miles west of Toronto. Yes, yes. Well, uh, that amazes me even more because I had this image that you were just traveling every single day of the year without care. Well, I sometimes feel as if I am. Uh, <laughs> during, my, uh, during my breaks from teaching, of course, I seize every opportunity to, uh, uh, to visit uh, Europe, and particularly uh, East Germany, yes. uh, Weimar and Leipzig and, uh, and uh, East Berlin, uh, where many of the main list archives still are. And I am at the moment on a leave of absence from the university because uh, I really felt without such a leave, um, I would not be able to complete Volume 2 in time for the anniversary year, which, as you know, is uh, 1986. Yes. Liszt was born in 1811. He died in 1886. And we're going to hear um, Lazar Berman play now. Um, let's hear the 10th Transcendental Etude. The F minor, yes, yes. It's one of my favorites. Good.
wonderful performance by Lazar Berman of the 10th transcendental etude in F minor, the only one I believe except to be, uh, yes, except number two that doesn't really have a title. That's correct. Um, none of them actually had titles in the 1839 version. Uh, after Liszt revised them, he decided to add uh, titles which give the impression that these are programmatic pieces. I think that's a misleading impression. Uh, Liszt simply wanted to, uh, well, he was following a trend of the time yes. by, by giving them such titles. Alan, we know that Liszt used to be known by some of his uh, uh, well, not not necessarily his his most wonderful works, uh, and they got in his way certain um, rhapsodies and so forth. And uh, it's such a voluminous uh, life, and his his creativity is is so vast. So finally, we are we are realizing his place in nineteenth century music, and it's a very high one, isn't it? Yes, uh, from a historical point of view. Um, I think Liszt was the most significant musician of that uh, marvelous age of music. Uh, that is not to say that I place him, um, uh, uh, if we look at the standpoint of the quality of his work, at the uh, at the, great, at the top. Uh, for instance, I, I personally, in this uh, this high level, it must remain a matter of personal opinion. I think Chopin is a greater composer than Liszt. Not everyone would agree with that, but that's where I stand. In the fineness of the output, Indeed. there's no doubt. Yes, uh, but. Uh, from the standpoint of the uh, historical significance, uh, the many discoveries that you observe Liszt making in his music, and uh, the influence of those discoveries on a later generation of composers, there's absolutely no doubt that Liszt is the father of modern music, yes. for instance. And uh, in, uh, as a teacher, uh, and as someone who, uh, by, by example, in the works that he composed, uh, his influence is still today working itself out. Uh, we, we need think no further uh, than uh, Olivia Messiaen, mm -hmm. uh, many of whose works uh, you can draw a direct line from the works of Messiaen, particularly the keyboard works, uh, back to the to the late works of Liszt. Absolutely, um, we could really speak for for an endless amount of time just on uh, what that that Listian tree has brought. Um, we will will have one more piece of music. Alan, and uh, we've been concentrating on this program, at least uh, on the Transcendental Etudes and the performance by uh, uh, the Russian Lazar Behrman. Let's hear that wonderful windswept um, work called Chasnej, the last of the etudes, mm -hmm. and how, oh, how difficult it is, those yes. tremolos. Yes. Uh, Tremolos were uh, were a nightmare for for Liszt's pupils. Uh, whenever he taught tremolos, his favorite uh, command was "Don't make omelets." <laughs> oh, that's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Alan Walker is my guest. Well, let's now hear that Chasnage, and we'll be back with some final words on this our program that we have had about his new biography of Liszt, Volume One. <laughs>
You have just heard uh, Chasnej of uh, Franz Liszt, the 12th Transcendental Etude, Lazar Berman, the pianist, and I'm very excited today because one of the real fine scholars writing on music is with me. His name Alan Walker, and he's a renowned writer on music, and he's devoted 10 years on this extraordinary volume one of a projected three, and he's working very hard on two and three. They are uh, published, they're going to all be, of course, published by Knopf, and this one has done very well. And I'm so glad that you've, you've been here today to uh, discuss some of your trials and tribulations. When you're back again, we'll talk more. But in the meantime, uh, you certainly don't look tired, Alan. Um, well, the book is helping to keep me young. <laughs> Let me put it like that. Well, mm. indeed, you are young. And I think Liszt is, uh, as Schumann once said of uh, Schubert's music, everlasting youth. I think uh, Liszt is that way. One final question. You know, may maybe 40, 50 years ago, pianists would uh, call Liszt a charlatan. They would play a few rhapsodies and, and so forth 60 years ago. And yet today, when you talk to pianists, about Liszt, there's a whole new reverence. Have you noticed that? Yes, I think that's simply because we're now playing Liszt as uh, pianists have always played Mozart and Beethoven uh, with uh, with some degree of uh, objectivity towards the music rather than regarding it as a, uh, uh, as a vehicle for personal virtuosity. And the music sounds better. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I think that there's one rule when performing Liszt and, and it will never let you down and it will always bring out the music behind the notes. Uh, and that is the uh, the less the more. Mm. The less uh, you as a performer bring to those notes, the more uh, music will come out of them. Uh, by the same token, the, uh, the, the more rhetoric you bring to a composer like Liszt, the more danger there is that you're going to push this music towards the, uh, uh, the brink of vulgarity. And that has been the undoing of mm. many pianists in the past. I'm, I agree with you entirely. The new generation of pianists uh, seem to show a new respect and reverence uh, for this music. Uh, and it shows. Yes, it surely does show, and it shows in the record catalogs coming out, and um, and in the quality of the performances. Uh, Buzoni would be very pleased with what has happened. Yes, uh, we uh, all owe him a, a great deal yes. for uh, for his uh, pioneering uh, work on behalf of Liszt. Alan Walker is in the process of volume two of his great project on Liszt, and I, for one, cannot wait to. Um, to read it, but at this moment there is so much to savor in volume one that I'm going home immediately because I have a cold, get into bed and begin from page one again. Alan Walker, thank you for coming and I'm um, so pleased that uh, you're happy with the outcome of volume thank one. Thank you so much for having me on your program. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening. <laughs>